Uh, good day, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our first episode of the McFin Insurance Dialogue, a new initiative to get the uh, African insurance market talking about pertinent issues affecting our markets, affecting our business. Today, I've got uh, experts from various uh, companies and various uh, markets as well. Um, by way of introduction, firstly, I'll introduce Yara. Yara uh, is from Mozambique. She will give her own uh, full bio. Uh, and then we've got uh, Sharon. Sharon is from Mauritius. She will also give a full bio. Uh, Charles from Tanzania and Kelvin Zimbora from Zimbabwe. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you may briefly introduce yourselves. Thank you, uh, uh, Simba, uh, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Charles Chanya. I am the underwriter uh, heading uh, facultative business at uh, Grand Re Tanzania. Uh, my, my background is basically uh, insurance. I have uh, over 10 years experience in, in the insurance, uh, insurance uh, market. I am uh, Sharon, Sharon Ning from Nima Insurance Managing Agency. Uh, we are based in Mauritius and we are in MGA. And I have a background in engineering and insurance for insurance. Hello, my name is Yara Souza. I'm the underwriting manager at Emeritus Re Mozambique. I'm a civil engineer and a chartered insurer with over nine years experience in insurance and reinsurance. Uh, thank you very much, Simba. Uh, my name is Kelvin Simbora. I'm currently the operations manager for Tropical Reinsurance uh, Zimbabwe. My background is basically applied physics with uh, IT, and I've been in the reinsurance space for over 13 years. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a quite uh, experienced panel that we have today. I hope the discussion will be uh, worth the value for our viewers. Now, just to introduce the topic, today we are discussing the practice of rate undercutting in insurance pricing. Uh, I should say, maybe let's talk about of it uh, is the notion, it's a notion of um, rate undercutting. Uh, we're going to go into the details of that. But just to give a background to the discussion, we are talking precisely about the short term uh, or non-life insurance industry. That's the basis of our discussion in terms of insurance pricing uh, and also as practiced in the insurance uh, markets. And insurance markets include the mainland Africa and uh, the African islands. Just as an introduction from my side, uh, I just want to uh, put some background information about insurance so that everyone is able to, to follow uh, where we are coming from with this discussion and why we are discussing rate making. Now, the insurance model uh, is based on the insurers promising to pay future claims uh, in return for a premium, which is a small amount uh, now. And part of the mystery for the insurance model is that the future claims and the future costs of managing the business are not known upfront. And this poses a, a challenge in terms of determining the appropriate price for insurance products. If you look at any other business, whether you're selling tomatoes, you're selling fridges, or you're selling cars, the basic principle is that uh, the price for the product uh, should be equal to the cost of producing and delivering that product, plus the targeted profit for the investor or for the producer or the seller of that product. But in the insurance industry, that model is not applicable strictly in that formula because part of the biggest component is the cost, which is a future value. We don't know when you are setting the price, we don't know what the cost is. So this is the background to how the insurance business model uh, operates as far as the pricing of the products works. And also, one thing also to look at is if you look at um, the, the pricing of the products, there are a lot of determinants, our panel members will talk about them, but one of the determinants is exposure. So the risks that are insured by insurers, whether from country to country or from city to city, 
uh, or from one company to another company, they all carry varying degrees of exposure. And therefore, that also poses another challenge to say what price should be applicable from one client to the other. Um, I hope I've given a fitting background to this discussion um, so that at least we understand where we are coming from. Now at this stage, uh, may I open up to our panel discussion for us to explore this topic. Um, and Charles, if I must start with you, what is a premium head? Uh, if you can explain to our viewers. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Simba, for, for this wonderful, wonderful topic here of today. And of course, much appreciation to you and the McFin team for, uh, you know, for choosing me as uh, one of the of the panelists. To go into the detail, premium rate is basically a unit unit price charged on the risky exposure which has been proposed for the insurance. Yeah. And of course, it's, it's normally uh, expressed in percentage. That's why it's, it's called a rate. So basically, simply it can be a price uh, for the risk exposure, uh, which is uh, for the risk exposure uh, proposed for the insurance. So in a, in a very, very simple uh, meaning of uh, the premium rate, I can say. Okay, so if your client walks in uh, to a broker or to an insurance company and you just say, uh, this is your rate, do you expect that the client should generally just understand what the rate is? Remember when I go to buy bread, when I ask for the price, uh, I'm told bread is 50 cents or whatever currency it is in your country. Is it the same with an insurance product or with the price of insurance? Now, uh, uh, as I said, uh, this this uh, unit price is expressed in the, in the, in percentage. So, to get the actual amount of money which the client need to pay, is is you take that uh, uh, premium rate times the exposure, and normally the exposure is in insured value or the limit of uh, indemnity, depending on the class of business which has uh, been proposed for the insurance. So. Uh, normally, the rate is, is included, but to bring more clarity to the clients is basically you multiply that rate, the premium rate, so that to get the actual uh, price, to get the actual number, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, charged to the client. Okay. Yara, is uh, Charles too technical with us here? <laughs> no, it's not too technical. You see, it is true. Actually, I would say that, okay, an insurance premium is the amount of money that the consumer will pay to get cover, to get mm. protection. Okay. And, and who determines that price? Um, the underwriters. The underwriters would determine the price, the price according to the exposure, according to the age, like let's say the type of coverage, the amount of coverage, or even the last history of the clients. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I understand, you know, different markets have got uh, different prices, uh, and, and this is an, an open question to, to all of us panelists. Um, is there a difference that you notice in markets uh, or a specific practice that you notice in, in, in your markets? For example, there might be an inclination towards regulators or government regulating the pricing of the insurance products, or uh, is the market just operating on a free market basis? Uh, maybe just a sense of what the practice do you have uh, in your various markets? Uh, Sharon? In Mauritius, uh, the regulator does not impose any any uh, premium rates or or any but different classes of business. Um, but it's more, I would say, a price war between the different seedants. Because, for example, if a client wants uh, to have insurance for a property insurance for their house, they would just go to different uh, students to um, ask for a quote. And uh, every student would be free to quote their own company policy and, and own underwriting and premium rates that they have 
agreed on on um, in the company so you would get different different prices from them but it would not be a very big difference i would say but um mauritius is a very competitive market and yeah everyone tried to beat the other one yeah uh kelvin is, is the practice different in uh, zimbabwe yes um it's slight i'll say it's slightly different um i think uh, sometime in the past um the were recommended minimum rates that were then proposed uh, by the regulator in terms of uh, not company specific per se but in terms of saying um industry specific to say if you're probably in the mining sector uh, you're looking at a minimum rate of so much if you're in the paper industry if you're in the uh, wooden pulp this was mainly for your fire risks and um, mainly minimum rates were then set for mortar but um, over the years what we've seen is that uh, there has been a deviation from uh, those set minimums and um, in so much as I'd like to thank you for bringing up this uh, topic <laughs> in terms of them saying um, what then is um, rate undercutting and uh, what effects do the, does it have on the insurance industry per se? Okay, uh, Charles, is, is the practice any different from your side? Uh, in Tanzania, the practice is more or less the same like uh, what they do in Zimbabwe. Uh, we have a uh, minimum rate, uh, which basically was gazetted by the government. So all the insurance players in the market need to follow that. But of course, that is the minimum. You, you can charge uh, more than that, but you cannot charge less than that. So, uh, and of course, it's, it's for all the classes flow from motor to, to fire and other uh, except a few uh, special special class like uh, uh, aviation perhaps uh, uh, directing officers liability so basically uh, the others we have like a bible which you know we are not uh, supposed to go under what is spe uh, uh, specified in that uh, rate i've been trading in a market where everything is allowed yeah. <laughs> it is a free market. There is no minimum rate. Yeah. yeah. You see, and, and then you can imagine how the premium rates are, are developing over the years. So it is really dropping every day. So it is a free market. Okay. So there's different practice. And obviously, where there's different practice, you are bound to also have quite a variation uh, in, in the prices. You expect uh, a wider range in terms of the prices. Uh, Sharon, uh, is there a correct rate, so to say, uh, in insurance? Uh, I don't think there is a correct rate for insurance pricing. Um, yes, the underwriters will make use of actual tables uh, and everything, but at the end of the day, uh, it all depends on di different factors um, and how the underwriter will interpret um, them. So, for example, um, an underwriter will have its own underwriting philosophy, its own guidelines. So this will also affect the, the, the rate, the insurance pricing. And there will also be uh, the market practice or trends. And depending on in which territory you are and, and the trends there, the risk country, um, the type of coverage as well and the loss history very important mm -hmm. <laughs> and also i think now uh, there's also the hard market or the soft market um because of covid and the reasons now i think we are starting to get into the hard market and i think all these factors will affect uh, the insurance pricing and there's also competition as well which can come into play that's, that's interesting so uh, Yara, you are operating in an open market. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's just just like Mauritius. <laughs> is you there know, a What happened is, as an underwriter, most of the times it's our instinct, it's our the way we perceive a risk that we determine the type of rates that we will be applying. It is something very personal that will depend on the instinct and the capacity to absorb risk of each underwriter. Uh, 
So most of the times, as I said, we operate in a very free market and we have to trust our instincts or our background about the risk or about the behavior of certain clients. So it is something we have the gut feeling. You have to <laughs> be always aware of what happens. So that's it. Yeah. Uh, Kelvin, th there must be some basis to write to pricing, right? Is, is there a correct rate? I, I want to say there is a correct or an incorrect rate. Um, like the previous, uh, well, like what Kiara and Sharon have alluded to, to say um, the rating is not an exact science. To mm. say, for instance, uh, one plus one is two, wherever you go, regardless of, uh, of the market. But mm. um, my belief is that um, for each particular type of risk, there is um, a minimum cost. You know, mm. like insurance, in, like being any other business, um, mm. we are uh, the shareholders uh, expect a profit. So mm. at the end of the day, insurance is not a dollar for dollar transaction. Um, and at the same time, we are selling a promise uh, mm. to, to pay for future losses. So in a nutshell, I'd say, no, there is no uh, correct rate, uh, there is no incorrect rate. But mm. um, as the previous speakers have said, um, the pricing then varies from market to market, um, yeah. from individual underwriter to underwriter. Um, depend economic, even fundamentals play in as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Competition and and the like. Thanks. I can see Charles is. In... <laughs> 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 no, that smile is a, is an agreement or. <laughs> Yeah, uh, basically, I totally agree with the with the previous speakers because uh, you know you you come to the premium rates the way you feel the risk mm -hmm. or the way you feel the exposure, and how do you feel the exposure? Basically, you feel the exposure depending on your company objective at that specific period of a time. And of course, you will feel the exposure depending on the competition around your market. And of course, you will feel uh, uh, the exposure depending on how that specific risk has been uh, performance, uh, performing for the past year. So we can basically charge different, you know, the same risk I can charge different from what Kevin can charge. So there is no uh, correct debt as long as the underwrite is comfortable with with uh, with the price specifically would be the correct uh, rate according to him or her but it would be uh, the incorrect rate according to the other person depending on how you feel the risk. Yeah. yeah so 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 Charles Charles and Kelvin uh, I think uh, Zimbabwe and Tanzania the uh, a history of market rates, as you said, I mean, maybe that that is no longer the case. There must have been a basis of coming up with those rates, uh, which should have been in some way uh, a correct way of looking at things to say at the bare minimum, this is what you should charge. I'm trying to get us to maybe explain to our clients if they're watching now to say, OK, when you come up with the price, this is, you know, some of the factors that we put in to come up with the price. Um, and this is maybe how the pricing is done. Uh, maybe if you would want to allude to that. Okay, uh, thank you, Simba. I think mm. um, basically what was uh, was done in the Zimbabwe market was that um, actuaries were actually engaged uh, in terms of then assessing the um, caliber of risks that uh, insurance companies were writing. I think mainly stemming from um, the results um, that are then published by uh, the insur respective insurers in terms of then saying um, how have they been performing um, certain classes of business, how have they been performing. And I think um, it, go it went back over several years to say you look at um, how generally the risks that have been underwritten in the Zimbabwe market have been performing vis-a-vis -vis the specific uh, line of business that that uh, particular risk is in. So I think that then became the fundamental basis of which these minimum rates were then drawn up. 
But um, I don't know, unlike uh, what uh, my colleague Charles has alluded to, uh, these were not uh, hard and fast to say, if you go below this particular rate, you will then face uh, some censure from the regulator. No, uh, these were purely just uh, recommended minimums. They were just a, sort of like a guideline that you then use. So obviously, from our side, um, what I would then take to it is to then say, each risk brings its own different uh, form of expo risk in terms of, uh, in, you know, insurance is a is a, um, is an industry that makes use of the law of large numbers to say the the misfortunes of the few are then uh, catered for by the fortunes of the many. So, in terms of then how you then price um, a particular risk, it then depends on the exposure it's bringing into my. Uh, risk pool. Um, and Charles, obviously, so I understand from Kelvin that the the minimum rates actually uh, determined, which means the actuaries who were engaged to actually look at the history of losses in the market and uh, come up with what they would consider to be minimum rates. And I, I understand that min when you say minimum rates, this means maybe a point at which you break even and make a reasonable uh, a profit. This was a, a same uh, approach. Um, I don't know the uh, background towards uh, the recommended uh, rate in uh, Zimbabwe, but uh, in Tanzania, uh, back in 2013-2014, uh, basically the insurance company were, were not uh, making good underwriting results. Uh, so the association of uh, Tanzanian insurers uh, basically while trying to get a solution on, on how they can improve their, their underwriting results, basically they, they appointed actuaries uh, who are uh, whom reviewed the experience of each and every insurance company and of course they combined, then they came up with uh, this uh, minimum rate. So it was basically a market driving experience the best sort of uh, exercise which was done by, by, by actuaries. So it's basically, if I can say, a similar methodology. And when you talk of the involvement of actuaries, you're talking of numbers, you're talking of facts, uh, something like that. Engineer here, how, how does the client know that I'm getting a good deal? Here in Mozambique, it is basically when they pay less premium. <laughs> we can, you can come up with all explanations and you go with the client step by step explaining why and the, all the reasons behind the premium charge but the mm. truth is the less the premium happier is the client here yeah what's happened yeah yeah so sharon uh, uh you you are you've got experience in the construction industry if i'm a project manager um i do one construction project i get a rate of say let's say 0 0.15 i go into the next project you come up and then say i'm supposed to pay 0 0.2 percent i'm still the same client um how do i look at this is there a way of you justifying to me why the price for project a should be different from project b it will depend. Maybe uh, for project A, the market uh, market trends or market rates were different, and uh, maybe the project A, I don't know, had a lot of claims, and uh, project B is, is because it's the same client and similar projects. Then um, the underwriter would be would deem it fit to increase the rate to be able to cover a bit of the that uh, they incurred in Project A. So Kelvin, it won't be anything to do with your feelings at that point or <laughs> budgeting a budget and you feel that I have to increase my premiums here. Because remember, we, we, we are not operating in isolation. We have got clients to deal with. We want them to get to an understanding of this is what could potentially be happening. Why? I would get a lower price than the next insured, or why I would get a, a different price for my previous project. What 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 else could be happening? Over and above what, what uh, Sharon has alluded to, 
I think the, the other aspect is then to say the risk that Project A had uh, and what Project B then has is different. I'll give an example to say um, the risk that, say, you're building a normal dwelling house uh, is different from the risk that is associated with, let's say, building a high-rise building or, let's say, a bridge or a dam. The mm -hmm. risk in itself is different in terms of then saying the exposure that the, the insurers will face is much higher than, um, let's say, road construction, for instance. That could be something else that is then uh, different from your from one project to the next. Okay, so it could be a difference in the risk classification, as you are saying, the, the amount of exposure that each risk is bringing to the pool is, um, uh, is different which necessitates a different price, uh, or it could be the, the, the losses that each, each type of project as Aaron has said is bringing could be different. Uh, Charles, who, who is the best judge of what a good rate is? Basically to me, it should be the, uh, <laughs> the client perhaps. Yeah? Uh, because that's one, it's, it's, a, it's a bit challenge, uh, challenging because uh, the, the client, as, as, as a client, can basically come with, uh, tell you that this is a too expensive sort of a price. So, mm -hmm. uh, or can tell you that this is uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, fair, fair, fair premium uh, according to, to the budget of the, of the client. So that, that, that perhaps I can say. So Sharon, you are the underwriters. Your market requests a quotation, you do a quotation, the broker comes back and says, yeah, the client has said, I've got so much budget. Right? Um, uh, this, this is my budget. <laughs> so, uh, as far as possible, like, we, we try to accommodate maybe uh, if we cannot go as low as they want, maybe we, would, we, we will adjust the terms like increase deductible or some stuff like that or put some exclusion to decrease our own exposure, um, which would be unable to get closer or even to match the target premium. But for me, God, uh, when I asked the client about their budget or target premium, they said yeah. they don't have a budget and they say the cheapest that you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Yara, how do you differentiate that? Uh, I'm getting from Sharon that there's a bit of flexibility. Uh, obviously, when you do your numbers, I think you leave room for, for a discount. Yes. How do you differentiate that from cash flow underwriting? Okay. You know what we try to do most of the times? Mm -hmm. We cannot just go to the client and say no, right? And as Sharon say, we try to play around with the deductibles. We try to find the uh, extensions and the exclusions that will protect us at some point, or even introduce some sublimits that will uh, also protect us at, uh, at, the, at a certain point. That's how we try to play around with it. Yeah. Because if we just go and say no, we lose all the business across. So we need to balance a bit. You need to balance. Even knowing that at some point it will affect our profitability, but for certain reasons we try to find uh, uh, ways to accommodate. For example, here in Mozambique, we are prone to cyclones yeah. and uh, premium rates continue low. So we are trying to set up cyclone access in all policies that we have in order at least to balance the level of claims that we have been receiving. But it's also been a challenge to mm. make the, the client understand that there is need to do that. Yeah. Otherwise, we, we suffer losses after losses and it, it will not be a profitable business. We are in business. It is true. <laughs> yeah. So that flexibility is, is a necessary component of every business. You can't operate any business if you are rigid yeah. on the pricing. But yeah. I just want to get a sense of how do you differentiate that flexibility? from cash flow underwriting, uh, Kelvin? Yes, um, if I may chip in there. Um, you see, the main purpose, um, generally what we've seen in terms of when uh, somebody is uh, cash flow underwriting, I think the major purpose would then be to I think raise um, revenue in the short term, mm -hmm. um, which is different from um, what Yara and Sharon are saying to say, no, look, we are putting this risk in a pool of risks. Mm -hmm. So 
in terms of how you then compromise, uh, your compromising should not affect your overall uh, okay. pool of risks that you are holding. To say, um, like Sharon alluded to, to say you increase the deductible, for instance, or you put in certain exclusions or exclude certain covers. What it's merely trying to do is to to align the premium to the risk that is then it's bringing into my pool of risks. Um, so different from cash flow, where in the sole purpose is really just to uh, generate revenue and not necessarily looking at it from a risk perspective. Yeah, uh, Charles, you have obviously witnessed some cash flow underwriting. How do you differentiate it from just being flexible, just being a flexible underwriter? I think, uh, as uh, the previous uh, speaker has uh, mentioned, I think yeah, it is it is very critical. Of course, flexibility is it's important because we are in the business. We need uh, to sustain the, uh, the business, but you know. We are not supposed to be, you know, to be uh, too much flexible. Uh, right. So we we need to put some shield uh, uh, on us, uh, like what uh, Yara uh, said. We put some deductible. We, we put some exclusion, uh, so that even though we are being flexible. Basically, we, we are not flexible uh, uh, too much to, you know, to damage our uh, ultimate result at the end of the year. Yeah, uh, that's that's what I can say. Yeah. Uh, Sharon, would you, if pushed to the limits, would, would you do cash flow underwriting? For me, uh, there's, there's a minimum that you need to go because uh, at the end of the day, we are not in charity, but we, are, we, we have a business to maintain and to, at the end of the day, we need to make profit as uh, the business would not be sustainable. So we need to find the, the right middle in not we like um, Yara said, we cannot say no right away to the client risk us losing business like the whole portfolio but we try to with them and see like to show them that we are accommodating on our side and if they can meet us in the middle as well so this, this is an open open question to anyone uh in terms of pricing are we uh solely looking at the number that you put up on the invoice as the premium or are there variations to the pricing, other components that you can bring in to make sure that your insurance rate or your, your, your premium rate or your price is commensurate? So I'm trying to say instead of just looking at the final invoice amount, are there other components that you can play around with to make sure that at least you are not prejudicing uh, the insurer or you are not prejudicing yourself as the underwriter? Uh, okay, uh, uh, Simba, thank you. Uh, I think, yes, there, there are components which basically are in control or from the, the underwriter. For example, the, the underwriter is in control of the management expenses, uh, so, so to say. So, because there is, uh, there is sort of, uh, you know, management expense you can, you can actually control at uh, one point of the time uh, if you work out your number so uh, to me um, that is aspect of the premium or, or the price which you can play around uh, for the purpose of accommodating the, the client what we've seen is that um, you can also incorporate your NCDs, your new claims discounts um, to say, no, look, if you haven't, if you're not going to have a claim, um, we'll then give you a certain discount or we have your long term agreements to say, no, look, um, we'll tie you down for the next couple of years. And if you don't have a claim, you're going to get a certain discount. Even to such an extent, I think some other policies we've seen issues to do with even issuing out a profit commission on a, on a policy to say if at the end of the period uh, the, the the risk has been profitable uh, there's something that goes back to to the insured okay okay now we sort of like agree that the the rate is flexible other markets are open you you charge what you want because the free market other markets there's a reference to to a minimum rate where does this issue of rate undercutting come from yeah uh i would say that it basically comes from the competitive 
to get competitive advantage. Most of the clients just want to grow their book, just want to get to the top of the ranking in terms of uh, market share, and they don't really uh, analyze the type of weights that they are giving to the client because they just want numbers. At the end of the day, they are not really worried about reserves. They are not really worried about their honoring their claims. Mm-hmm. They are just worried about their top line. And what happened is that uh, in order to get the clients, the premiums start being undercutting. It becomes a practice where a client goes to company A and they say 0.1. When it goes to company B, they say how much they gave you there. Okay, I will reduce it by 50%. And it goes on and on. It is something that has been hap- it's happened here in the market where I'm trading now. And uh, it is our daily coffee. So <laughs> with premium undercutting is really a serious issue because at the end of the day, it really affects reserves. It affects even our ability to honor claims. Yeah, Sharon, so if we've agreed that there is no correct threat and there is no statutory rate to price, where do we come from to say so and so is undercutting? <laughs> good, quite good, and but in a question. <laughs> so, um, like I said, yes, there, there is no good or bad rate, but still, we need to have enough premium to be able to earn other claims at the end uh, when when we get the claims. So, mm-hmm. if we uh, give a too low client, then the the amount of premium in our pool would be too um, not enough to honor all the claims. So we need we need a, a minimum that would be able to make that pool uh, like end up on a positive note at the end of a year. Yeah. So Charles, the, the reason why your market ended up saying we need minimum rates is exactly what Sharon is talking about. To say, in terms of the insurance market itself, we are no longer looking at the client as a unit, or we are no longer looking at the insurance company, but we are looking at the industry as a whole, that in order for the business to be sustainable, the industry as a whole is supposed to raise a certain minimum amount of premiums, right? Um, But still my question is, if your client goes to the next office and the next office decides to say, okay, it's fine, I'll give you a 20% discount. At what point do we judge that to be undercutting? Yeah, basically we just, that is, uh, you know, undercutting where there is uh, there is imbalance between the risky exposure and the premium charged. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah? Um, how 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 can you can you determine uh, then that there is imbalance or the the premium charged is not commensurate? Because uh, you will basically look on the on the on the market trend. You look on the loss experience of that given uh, class of business or that class uh, that specific client. Then uh, you come to realize that the premium which I have charged uh, basically um, is is not worth it for this client. Yeah. For example, perhaps. You are underwriting a fleet of motor, and looking on the experience, they are on 70, 80 percent loss loss experience, depending on the premium which they were paying from the other market or the premium which they have paid this year. If you charge lower than that, then you will feel that you 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 basically undercut it. A very good point, Charles, because I think the first point you are bringing to the table is that the premium that you are collecting is supposed to be adequate enough to pay claims. So the moment you start collecting less premiums or collecting premiums that is not sufficient to cover your claims and expenses, for me, that, that's the definition of undercutting with or without involvement of, of competition. Um, but Kelvin, just to, to, to come to you also um, on that on that notion of, of, of undercutting. Yeah, two big elements there Sorry. is the claims and the management expenses. And one of the elephants in the room on the management expenses is commissions. Then you can you maybe part of your explanation also uh, uh, touch on the commission's issue also? Um, If I may start from the issue on um, 
a late undercutting. Mm. Um, my understanding is um, adding on to what Charles had said, is to say, um, you know, undercutting is when a risk is priced uh, below uh, nominal uh, economic levels to such an extent that uh, it then becomes unviable to, to underwrite that particular risk. Uh, in comparison, um, I'll give an analogy to say, I think in is it in law they talk of uh, the reasonable man test. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, from for us uh, it will be purely based on, if I may equate it to the reasonable underwriter test, to yeah. say does it then pass that test? If it doesn't pass that test, then uh, ultimately it's um, it can be perceived as being an undercut risk in terms of the rate. And then coming back, coming on to the issue of commissions, I think um, that's one of the most topical issues uh, we're having in the market, uh, whereby I think uh, we've seen commissions um, being um, on the higher side, uh, mm -hmm. despite there being uh, regulated uh, commi commission levels that uh, have been gazetted by, by the regulator. But I think of late, uh, what the regulator has then said is to say, I think um, the way the commissions are now creeping into the premium that is ordinarily supposed to remain as the as your risk reserve uh, pool. So mm -hmm. the the commission has actually gone forward to say um, insurers should then stick to the regulated uh, commission levels that are in the market. Um, so, Yara. One of the issues uh, highlighted by, by Kevin and Charles is that the price has to relate to at least to the costs and there has to be a minimum benchmark below which you can go as, as an underwriter. For example, if you are in Mozambique, uh, everyone knows the price of bread, the price of bread, not necessarily the same price in each shop, but at least there is a benchmark somewhere. One of the reasons is that the cost of the inputs into the production of bread is known to everyone. Now, one of our biggest problems in Africa is information. <laughs> it's about underwriting information. Uh, 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 how do you feel that uh, in terms of affecting the, the rates that we then uh, see on the market? Okay. One of the main issues is competition. Mm. We are not playing at the same side. We are not together. So if I get a risk, I don't share with my colleague from the other company the issues that I had with the same risk. Yeah. Probably the, the client had the claim and moved to the other company and goes to the other company and receives a discount. Mm -hmm. Discount for what? For claiming? So the, <laughs> the main <laughs> point is as long as we keep acting like we are fighting, we will not go move forward. At some point, we need to get together, understand that we need to protect our markets in order to move forward and act as, act as one company, not isolated uh, uh, silos. That's the main reason why today we have the problems that we have in terms of rate undercutting and uh, all issues related to rates dropping years over years. Yeah, uh, Yara, that's, I think that's, that's a good wish, but why, why should I play on your side if you're competing for the same business? Uh, uh, what, what do we do about information? That, that's one of the key inputs. You try business, you try and underwrite business, you mm -hmm. find that your insurers, your underwriters, no one is interested about loss history, no one is interested about what are the particular circumstances of the client. The client, yeah. Grant writing and accepting risk. Sharon, what, what do we do about it? to maybe have some trainings or or more conferences to discuss about like what um you're trying to do simba like some kind of conference or discussions on on the issues that we are facing in the market because at the end of the day if we continue like that we don't cooperate and share information and writing information then it is our market which will be affected and um, 
company as well. And even if we like competition and and business, but we, it needs to be at the end of the day a healthy competition where we can uh, give a price which is appropriate for the risk and even give a disc where it need it needs to be given, not like. Um, Yara said, need give a discount when the client made the claim. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, you, <laughs> you, you seem to be agreeing as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, I do agree with, with Shannon. However, uh, you know, you know the, the problem, the problem um, of undercutting, I think it should be viewed uh, uh, industry-wise. Because, because you know, you know why it happened. Because um, each insurance company or insurance company has its own targets and objective for the specific period of a time. Mm. So that that goal, that uh, object, that is what push the company to do the undercutting or not to do the undercutting. Yeah. So. I think I think it, it should be an, uh, a market agreement that you know our competition should be on service, not on or not on, on, on pricing. Yeah, that I agree. Who, who, whoever service the clients better will get the, the clients, not not on 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 undercutting the price. So I think yeah, it, it should be um, an agreement, a market agreement. Uh, and of course, perhaps it should be, you know, you know, it should be enforced perhaps by the by the, the regulator. But uh, I don't know. We are we are in free business. We are in free world. So I don't think it would be better if every everything the the, the regulator intervene. But I think as professionals, we need to sit and talk because you can't you can't have an account today and that account make you lose money then shift to another company and make that company lose money uh, uh, again it, it keep rotating so i think it should be as a professional we, sh we should uh, uh, sit and and uh, put some ground rule on on how to deal with this sort of thing yeah, Charles. Uh, I think also that's a that's a good wish. But your clients, I think, and and, and you know, <laughs> consumer consumer rights groups won't agree to you to sit down and and collude, uh, you know, to punish your clients. <laughs> what, what do you do about this? I think um, what the my fellow panelists are saying is uh, it's quite correct to say there has to be some form of. Uh, um, agreement. Um, probably I'll just pose this as a question to the fellow panelists uh, in terms of uh, how has been the prevalence of uh, completion of uh, proposal forms because ultimately that's where we get the underwriting information from in terms of your previous insurer, your previous uh, loss histories and um, that then becomes the basis because it's a document that then forms part of the insurance contract and um, to then say if any claim um, happens and it is at parallel with what you have stated on your proposal form, then that means um, the insurers have every right to, to repudiate that claim. So just to find out uh, how has been the prevalence in your markets uh, regarding the completion of proposal forms. I would say from Zimbabwean perspective, I think it's one of the uh, sticky points uh, that uh, we have in terms of uh, clients not willing to to complete forms or paperwork but interestingly uh, if they walk into any bank uh, they are asked to fill 10 pages to open an account they will, they will gladly do that so i don't know what has been your experience in terms of in terms of proposal forms you don't see them but wait for the claim forms the claim forms are there <laughs> fully complete <laughs> <laughs> you know, at placement stage, no, it's difficult to get the client to fill the proposal form. Please, can you? Can I have indicative terms? But when the claim rings, you have a complete claim form. I can assure you. But the proposal form, <laughs> at all, no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
sometimes you can get you can get the proposal form but again you get the wrong information because you you have no way to verify that information the other company perhaps won't won't give you uh, the access to the to the to the previous insurance um, information so it become a very very challenging um so i, I don't know yeah so, so for me i mean look uh, my question would be are we innovating enough are we evolving enough because my perception is that the environment of controls is slowly being rendered ineffective right there are other industries that are cropping into the mainstream insurance industry um, if you talk of fintech you talk of uh, the banks you talk of um, you no know, you can talk of a, a wide range of uh, yeah, innovative solutions that are coming on board and if we are getting stuck on, on the control environment i think sometimes we may miss the mark my question is, is the insurance industry innovating enough in terms of how we collect information, in terms of updating our underwriting and, and pricing models? Are we innovating enough to make sure that one, we survive, and two, we keep collecting enough to, to cover our risks? I think we are, but we have to up our games. Mm. Yeah, we, we, are, we are somehow, um, um, up, uh, I mean, uh, innovative, but we really need to to push more because uh, uh, the, mo the the world is moving very very fast and uh, if we we don't put ourselves together now, we'll be left behind. So we really need to to up our games. Regarding innovation, I've seen uh, that in some. Uh, sectors like uh, some students are starting to set up uh, platforms where the insured can just uh, enter the information so that um, instead of filling in proposal form, like we said, proposal form, it, it's very difficult for them to fill. I don't know why, <laughs> but um, the, the, some students now offer a platform where they can enter the information from their home without going into into um, the different branches of accidents. And uh, it seems that uh, slowly, slowly it's getting um, into um, the market. And I hope it like it's con it continues because then um, the information will be online and easily shared with insurers as well. And uh, regarding rating of quotes, I've seen that some, if, if you can fill your information online, an instantaneous quote, um, if your answers are just standard and, and yeah, for, for uh, simple um, insurance like uh, medical or, or health, um, yeah, health insurance or motor as well, it's easily, they can easily obtain uh, quotes instantaneously from an online platform. Yeah, yeah um, I totally agree. I think um, a lot is being done um, in the insurance and reinsurance space in terms of innovation. Um, I think there's been a lot of concerted efforts in terms of uh, creating uh, databases. Um, I know in Zimbabwe we do have um, a crimes bureau whereby, you know, if um, citizens then supply information in relation to, um, let's say, fraud, possible fraudulent claims, and uh, they're then kept in a database. And also from an insurance or reinsurance space in terms of uh, maintaining data, I think um, gone are the days when we used to keep uh, stacks and stacks of files. Uh, I think uh, we're now moving into cloud space, whereby data is then stored on a cloud and you have the information that you require for a particular client uh, from the click of a button. Even if the client was with you um, five years ago and they moved to another insurer, you can then still bring up the data in relation to how that parent client, particular client uh, performed over, over the, the duration when they were still with you, rather than trying to go into your uh, archives and uh, trying to look up a, a dusty folder. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. So although slowly, but we are trying to move to a more digital way of doing things. Yeah. Actually, there is a company here who developed like an aggregated website in mm. order to, to get the end consumer 
loading data in, and get uh, terms from different uh, companies. Wow. They are still it's a, a beginning stage and they are tr- st- trying to sell it. It is not easy, but they are trying to sell it. Yeah. And then we are also seeing uh, insurance companies now having applications in order to get the uh, quotations to uh, place a claim and uh, and even to get more information about uh, the company. So it is moving slow. It's a bit slowly, but it's moving. I believe that uh, in the next years if the situation will be. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, so Kelvin, you you spoke about the reasonable underwriter, which we assume everyone must be, meaning we must please strive to collect enough to pay claims and to pay expenses. There must be long-term consequences of being an unreasonable underwriter. Uh, there must be consequences to undercutting in the long term. Uh, yes, yes, uh, obviously. Um, like um, earlier mentioned, the the first um, effect is purely then on your reduced revenue because at the end of the day you're not collecting as much as you should and then that then brings in a knock-on effect to say if you're not collecting as much as you're supposed to be collecting that Mm. means um, you may not be in a position to then meet your obligations vis-a-vis your claims when they come through and once that then happens you then even have aspects whereby you have uh, reduced profitability because Mm -hmm. at the end of the day you do not have uh, uh, sufficient uh, uh, revenue you haven't collected or priced uh, your your risks accordingly and Mm -hmm. this has an effect to then say when we now look at the market holistically to say when we then aggregate the players that then even affects uh, the market loss ratios because at the end of the day for the same number of claims um, the, you have collected um, less premium per se so mm-hmm. when you then aggregate your your premiums and your losses you will then find uh, you then have higher um, loss ratios which then also has an open effect in terms of then saying it then um, when the actuaries then look at the data and say no look your insurers insurers are not making money your products are not priced accordingly it then forces then the prices to go up in terms of then saying you then disadvantage those that are already contributing um, adequate premiums to to your to your pool so i think um, that also then speaks to issues to do with you don't have your illiquid you don't have your liquidity challenges and um, then move on to cash flow underwriting which is in itself creates more problems yeah so so charles um, is it correct to assume that if you are undercutting uh, in the market long-term consequences is uh, as covid is putting across the consequences are dire should we be worried about one underwriter or one insurance company that is undercutting because in the long term they are going to suffer the consequences should we be worried all of us as market players uh, absolutely simba we we have to be uh, worried about uh, the practice of an individual underwriter to undercut because uh, it will definitely affect the whole market in in a long run because mm. if if i have uh, um a behavior of undercutting perhaps uh, i'll take some of the of the clients from the other companies perhaps if i take the other company will, 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 will basically uh, push back and basically uh, uh try to get because as i said you you basically as a company you have uh, a target you have objective both uh, at the top line and at the bottom line. So, if you, if you find yourself uh, losing on the top line, even even though you do good in, on the bottom line, basically you you will face uh, backlash from the board and the owner of the company. If just like that, so I think you you will start um, doing the the undercutting. So, I think. We should be worried about individual underwriter who uh, practice the undercutting, and of course we have to condemn that uh, sort of uh, habit because 
it 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 makes the the market uns, uh, sustainable at, uh, in the long run yeah yeah sharon should you be worried about your competitors if if they are undercutting eventually they will think why, why should we be worried <laughs> Uh, yes, like we we should be worried if they are undercutting because in the short term uh, it it is bad for us in the short and long term as well because short term we are losing business. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but in in the long term as well, the client will already uh, I've already seen this uh, when the client got. Um, in, in, in an insurance premium for uh, like an undercut price, and then the next year, um, like if if the the um, the current uh, underwriter who had undercut the premium didn't like it or is not maintaining that price because it's not it is not sustained anymore because they got too many claims and 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 cannot maintain that price, then the next year they will increase the premium and the client will come um, out in the market to look for this with over over sedents and and we will not be able to match it and then uh, what will happen because the client will already be uh, used to that low pre low premium and and they won't understand why we cannot help them um, at that premium so it would be uh, bad for for everyone I would say the, the whole market. Yeah, uh, Yara, you know, in business, there's a saying that uh, cheap is cheap. Um, I mean, uh, it, it has to play both ways. If the clients are chasing uh, low premiums, there's a chance at some point that they will not be able to recover from, from the issues. I mean, uh, I don't know how, 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 I, how can it across to make clients understand that going for the cheapest price is not always the best. Okay, uh, I believe that the, one of the best ways to learn about it is at claim stage because uh, you pay a low premium and then when it comes to a claim, the same company will not be able to honor the claim. Yeah. So at that more particular moment, the end consumer should understand that maybe it's the reason that the company is accepting low premiums and now he's not able to honor the claims. But what happened is most of the times when that happened, they end up uh, with the feeling that all the insurance industry is just histories. Yeah. They don't understand that the main problem is the fact that we are paying low premiums. They are not able to cover up all expenses and honor our claims. Yeah. So, so it is uh, a work that should be done between insurers, brokers and end consumer so that yeah. they and consumer has a full view of the impact of the uh, low, low premium rates that they are paying at some point. Yeah. And the only way, unfortunately, the only way that they understand it is when it, it comes to claims. Yeah, but, but we don't want it to get that. We don't want it to get that. We, we love our clients. They must yeah. be, when there's a loss, how yes. can we avoid this practice of rate undercutting? What's... I, I would say education. It, uh, financial education, uh, insurance education, from the moment that they understand exactly what does insurance mean, the value chain of insurance, I believe that from that moment they will understand that there is a price to pay. We are not buying potatoes. It is, yeah. we are buying cover. It is, yeah. <laughs> it is a, a financial <laughs> institution. So I believe that education will be key. Yeah. If we go around and educate our clients in order to make them understand, I, I believe that it can work. Education can be a good one. Yeah, Kelvin, you are smiling inside. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm inside and outside. I mean, <laughs> the guys are hitting the nail. The nail. Yeah. Head. yeah. <laughs> what 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 must we? Do? I totally agree. I think um, clients need to be sensitized in terms of um, the effects. Um, I know some clients are aware. Um, because what you've seen is um, a client walks to, into with insurer A and then they get a rate, they go to insurer B and say, uh, can you possibly match this uh, rate I got from insurer A? I think some clients are aware in terms of them saying, if uh, anything were to happen, uh, this insurer may not be able to then uh, honor its obligation. But I think it all starts um, in sensitizing our clients, uh, our um, uh, markets in terms of them saying what effect 
does this have like you really rightly mentioned to say uh, cheap is cheap you know if you if you're gonna <laughs> get uh, um, something for peanuts uh, you better be prepared to to take the peanut shells as well and um, do you believe regulators have got a role to play in, in fixing this mess they do but um, I think um, what we've seen um, is not necessarily them coming in to enforce. I think their um, um, position is more on a moral suasion uh, basis to say um, this is not good for you, it is not good for the industry, and it's not even best practice. So yeah. you are then encouraged to to do the right thing and not to necessarily say you are probably creating a statutory instrument on uh, on minimum rates um, but um, also what i see um, it's, it's what is also interesting is the coming on board of uh, link is if 17 whereby um, in terms of uh, just a snippet in terms of then saying it then forces you to then say um, in terms of how you recognize your your profit to say if you are going to look at your present value of cash flows against your uh, liability for 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 future um, liability for the remaining coverage uh, you then find that uh, you may end up with an onerous contract and uh, once you have an onerous contract what if 17 then says is to say you are supposed to recognize that in your PL immediately but yeah. if it's then profitable um, it's going to be deferred uh, throughout the duration of the, the policy period i think that in its way will then maybe correct this anomaly in terms of pricing because uh, no shareholder would want to see their financials uh, filled with very onerous contracts <laughs> thanks <laughs> yeah um charles what 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 can be done uh to me to me uh basically a fine difference from from yara and um and kevin a bit but <laughs> we on the same 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 route yeah. i think uh, to me, the focus should be um, should be on the on the insurance company. Should be on the underwriters uh, because uh, they are the driver of this uh, undercutting thing. Yeah, mm. because uh, if I give a client a lower price and then goes to another underwriter, get a, a, a more lower price than mine. <laughs> then we are the one who are influencing this. So yeah. I think we, we should we should, you know, the, the sensitization and education should be on the underwriters. Mm -hmm. And of course, and of course to the board of directors, uh, they need to understand that if if uh, if they're pushing their incentive, they're pushing their remuneration, it should not focus much on the top right. It should uh, focus on 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 the core core uh core business of the company which is the underwriting profit so whatever amount they, they're making as long as they're making uh, a profit it should be okay to them because if you push the management if you push the underwriter on the top line basically the, the issue of or undercutting will be you will be there but if if you you tell them that you you focus on the bottom of you focus on the underwriting profit mm -hmm. uh, then they basically give a price which which is commensurate to the risk which they they're taking and of course if if there is that common understanding between the players in the market that means if i give a price of of two dollar for a cover mm -hmm. i'm expecting a, a two dollar cover from other company or a two and a half dollar to another company which is not that much different but if i'm giving a two dollar cover and that one is is, is uh, the other underwriting is, give, uh, is giving one dollar cover for the same same exposure 
that is where the problem comes. But if we have a common understanding, we can actually push this to the to the client. Because if I go to underwriter X, I'll get the same price. If I get uh, to underwriter Y, I'll say I'll get the same the same price. Yeah, I think in charity should be given at home. They say. Yeah, yeah. So Charles, if I manage to improve my underwriting models, I manage to cut my cost, I manage to differentiate my product, why should I still charge the same $2 that you are charging? Uh, Cheryl, I mean, what what else can we do about data undercutting? Uh, I'll just leave you hanging there, Charles. But <laughs> maybe Cheryl, you can come in. What should we do about this? Uh, for me, um, as mentioned, it's important to educate um, uh, everyone in the chain so that they understand the, the, the like what we are trying to do what we are selling the product and um like why rate undercutting would be bad for both uh like for everyone like all parties involved and yeah the, this is important and um yeah i think that's right. Yeah, Charles, uh, Charles I, I, I believe you want to address my question. I, yeah, I... yeah uh, basically, so what I'm, uh, I want to, to, to say on your question is, yes, you can improve your system, you can, you can minimize your management expenses, but the reduction or the deduction of, I mean, the reduction of the, of the price will be there, but won't be that effective. Uh, I mean, what that that uh, uh, huge uh, reduction? It, it it won't be twenty. I mean, it won't be fifty percent. Perhaps it be ten percent or fifteen percent. That one, it's it's accommodatable and it can be just fine. So that I have improved my services. I have cut down my cost. That's why perhaps I'm charging this much rate. But you cannot tell me that I'm charged fifty percent uh, less because I have improved my, my my process because I have reduced my management expenses. Uh, I, I don't know. You 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 are you are the insurance broker. Are you are you are you ready if I reduce your your your, your commission by fifty percent? I, I think that that argument should yeah. be there, but. Mm. It is it is the, the reduction of I mean the the, the, the deduction of the rate uh, should not be that much. Yeah. Um, so Charles, I, I I do agree with you, and um, you see I think we 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 are operating in a rapidly changing environment, and one of the rapid changes that are coming through the market is obviously um, infiltration of, of of disruptive products disruptive innovations and just to give you an idea there is um, one article that I've uh, accessed recently uh, if you check my LinkedIn post you will see I've posted that article and one of the leading business people in the world Elon Musk says he wants to innovate in the insurance industry because the chain is too long and the clients are paying for the long chain there are too many intermediaries and agencies in between and that is the basis of my question I'm asking if someone comes and innovates enough are we going to stand and challenge them and say your discount is too big uh, is there room for us to innovate is there room for us to do things differently that's I, that's, that's what i'm trying to challenge now of course if it's if it's just fire mm. if it's just fire of course um yeah it, it, it cannot be treated as uh, undercutting because you know the evidence which perhaps the underwriter, you know, there are so evidence which can be seen that uh, the underwriters has taken some step uh, to basically um, streamline the uh, the processes, you know, uh, reduce the uh, the management ex uh, expenses and all that. So if it can be just five, and of course can be seen. Perhaps uh, you, I can, I can take it because perhaps as an underwriter, I, 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 I will need that sort of innovation as well, so that I, I, I push uh, uh, some of the expenditures uh, and of course the markets grow. You know, you know what my cry is 
you charge a certain premium rate of a certain price, which at the end of the day, it becomes difficult for you to, to pay the claim, uh, the claim when it comes. That, mm. is, that is my, 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 my challenge. That is uh, perhaps the, the definition of, uh, of the undercutting. So if, yeah. if you're charging a 50% premium less, and whenever the claim come, you honor them uh, properly, uh, perhaps, then there is no problem because, you know, and of course you put in some return on the, on the, on the money of the shareholder, then yeah. there is no problem on that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Charles. I think you very well uh, put there. I couldn't ex improve that ex explanation. Uh, I think it's something that uh, everyone would quite understand. Any last closing remarks uh, from the pan panelists? Um, if I may add to what Charles was saying, I think um, the, there's a lot of innovation happening, um, strategies that are being that are coming up. Um, say for in your marketing, for instance, you have uh, concepts like uh, predatory pricing or penetration pricing, which um, work well when you're looking at the manufacturing space or when you're selling uh, goods and commodities. But the, those strategies do not conform um, in the insurance space because um, what we have in insurance is uh, is an uncertainty. Um, we do not have um, a fixed say to say, no, look, um, for this year, for this particular client, I'm going to be paying X amount in terms of claims. So therefore, I can charge so much. But um, the whole concept is to then say you're building a a reserve in terms of say from which you will then pay anticipated or future losses in that are known in the future so some strategies may work best in the manufacturing but they do not work uh, when it comes to the insurance space yeah so 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 kevin you are saying sometimes what we are calling innovation is actually a penetration strategy the guys will realize when they're in the industry that they need to charge the correct price yeah possibly <laughs> yeah right closing remarks yes uh, as we uh, openly say actually when we talk about undercutting rate it's when we are talking about a reckless way of just reducing premiums but from the moment that the portfolio is well management and well analyzed and the, the rate is detected according to the behavior of the portfolio we cannot longer call it uh, uh, undercutting because we know that the underwriting understands exactly to what extent he is exposed and then talking about innovation so if we reduce the the the, the value chain of the um, steps that we have in terms of insurance of course the risk will reduce uh, at, at some time ago I was reading somewhere that for some life uh, companies the a person the gym card of the person is linked to the insurance for the number of days that the person goes to the gym reduce the premium at the end of the period so there are things that are being done to reduce and minimize the risk so at that point we do understand that okay rates may drop a bit it is not undercutting it is portfolio management <laughs> Charles, uh, uh, Yara seems to agree with you on innovation <laughs> your last comments I, I I think I agree with uh, uh, with Kevin and uh, Yara uh, on, on what they, they said yeah and of course we are in the information era and of course the technology yeah so we really need to use the information we have uh, to develop uh, strategies uh, to develop i mean to come up with the innovative idea innovative uh, uh, tools which basically um, can uh, you know can make the insurance uh, um, uh, market uh, uh, profit uh, profitable mm -hmm. yeah that, that's that's what i can say thank you charles uh, sharon last word um I agree with what everyone said and regarding rate undercutting um, under, and underwriter reduces the rate and uh, he still find a way to, stay, to for it to be sustainable and he's still able to manage and pay claims and still make profit then I think it's still uh, okay it, it is not called rate undercutting it is only when they, they reduce the rate so much that um, 
it's it's not viable for them um, in the future to pay claims, then it's, it is a problem. And I believe um, technology may help us in the future to uh, help and decrease the price of premiums, um, like my other uh, the, the other panelists mentioned. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, if, if I may sum up, I think from the from the discussions we've we've had is that uh, the primary thing is that the, the insurance premium collected must be commensurate with the risk or with the exposure that the client is bringing into the pool. And when you look at the the pool, we are not looking at, um, uh, strictly at one insurance company. We are looking at it from a, an industry. Uh, industry point of view, industry level. And of course, the key thing is that we are supposed to collect adequate premiums to pay claims. And from what I gather is that the the aspect about rate undercutting is not so much about charging less than your competitors or charging less than the other insurance company. It's so much about making sure that you are collecting adequate premiums to honor claims. So if at some point you are then not able to honor claims, it means one of the problems is you are not collecting enough premiums. So there's an element of um, undercutting there. Definitely a lot of ways to, to, to improve the situation, uh, training, uh, innovation, uh, cost cutting, and so forth. Um, I hope our viewers and followers have gained a lot from this discussion. Um, if you wish to ask questions, our panelists are here. I believe they're experts in, in, in various ways. Um, you can contact them directly on their uh, platforms. The information will be shared here. Um, and you can also discuss on this platform also for public discussion, if we may. Thank you so much uh, to uh, my dear panelists. Thank you so much for making time for this discussion and for your uh, valuable uh, and well-researched uh, contributions to this discussion. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.